Welcome back to the Truth Over Comfort Show. On one of our last videos, we discussed how Russia received exports, dual use, civilian and military uh, equipment all the way up until the invasion. And China received 1.6 billion worth of equipment, including military stuff. And they both received viruses from uh, old Liz Truss herself when she was uh, Secretary of Trade who authorizes the exports there. So I encourage you to check that out. This video is going to be a, a series of sort, not as in continually, as in like in a row, just over the course of time, just basically instances of the US or maybe other states, but generally the US showing how it's complete gangster mafia stuff. Like the, you can't even believe what they've said or they're trying to do and just clearly show they're like, they don't care about other people the law or anything they they see themselves from above it and they're just a gangster state at the end of the day and uh, i'm going to show you some clips today that shows just that and uh, it's uh, it was pretty egregious stuff i mean i found it because of a video with jimmy door and i'm going to have a little bigger with uh jimmy door and aaron Marte. I, I recommend everything by uh, Jimmy Dore, Aramate. I think he even got it from Ben Norton at the old Grey Zone. But it was basically a video where they're talking about Syria and the war and a US official who was at a think tank who says some pretty outlandish stuff about what they're going to do, basically because the proxy was lost, what they can still hold over them and use as leverage because they still occupy the north uh, east of the country has a lot of their resources and you can hear it all in her own words and you can even hear her in the senate where she says a different thing about oh they're there for isis but aaron Marte wrote an article about this i would again encourage you to read it uh but i think i'm gonna jump straight into it so she is called uh actually what's the article to keep troops in syria u.s leaders are lying like afghanistan and the person of feature today is Dana Straw. And uh, everything will be in the show notes to, uh, today. Make your mind up about uh, about the comments. But you show any person on earth this and uh, you'd be, <laughs> you, you can't miss it. You can't miss it. So this is her, not her. She's about to come on at the Senate. I'm going to make myself a bit smaller and play it now. So this is in 2021. And the video I'm going to show after is from before. But it's a Senate Committee on Foreign Relations holds hearing on US security in the Middle East, the 10th of August, 2021. So I'm just going to minimize myself and show you this video. Stroll, one of the places where we've seen uh, the proxy war playing out is in Syria. Um, I very much appreciated your leadership as co-chair of the Syria Study Group, as someone who worked on that legislation. I was really hopeful that the recommendations that the group came up with could make a difference in Syria. Can you talk about what, if any, of those recommendations have been um, implemented by the Biden administration and what you see going forward to address Syria? Thank you for that question, Senator. First of all, one of the key recommendations of the Syria study group was that we should retain our U.S. military presence in northeast Syria, both because ISIS is not defeated, because we made commitments to the Syrian Democratic Forces that they continue to fight ISIS but cannot do that with it without our support, training, and advice, and because there are tens of thousands of ISIS detainees still under SDF custody, as well as families of ISIS fighters at the al Hol IDP camp. We provide, through security cooperation authorities and funding, support and training so that there is a humane and humanitarian approach to the families and children while we facilitate relocation to the countries of origin of those foreign fighters and facilitate long-term solutions to the Syrian and Iraqi detainees. So first of all, uh, for retaining U.S. military presence, the Biden administration is committed to retaining U.S. military presence in northeast Syria. It is also committing to addressing the humanitarian crisis. That is another uh, priority that the Syria study group sought, sought to shine light on is the humanitarian crisis. With the Biden administration, we have not only increased our humanitarian aid to not just northeast Syria, 
but the rest of Syrian civilians in need, and we have uh, restored stabilization assistance. So areas that were liberated from ISIS have the opportunity to rebuild and, and are not no longer vulnerable to ISIS influence. Um, Ms. Stroll, I would encourage you to engage with the All right. <clears throat> so make a note of some of the stuff she said. It's all about, obviously, they need to be there to help with ISIS. They need to be there for humanitarian reasons. They need to be there to help rebuild. And rebuild is a big one. And this is 2021, so it's after her comments. But, you know, she's at the Senate. I haven't watched this whole thing. Uh, but I'm going to go to the next clip where she says a completely different thing, which is uh, funny that. So they're at the center for strategic international studies. And we can take a look at them after. I'm sure they're funded. I should have looked before, but I'm sure they're funded by arms companies and different countries. But so this is in 2019, October. So, of course, it is about a year and like eight months or whatever before. You know, maybe she's had a big turnaround, but just t take a listen to these absolute gangster mafia statements. Like some of the language she uses is insane, and the stuff that they're saying is horrible. It's horrible. October, a uh, series of decisions uh, have happened that have shaped uh, the, the battlefield, at least, uh, dramatically, um, introducing uh, additional factors into the equation. Um, just leave it there. Um, <laughs> but given recent U.S. decisions on Syria, um, what sources of leverage do we have going forward, uh, given Russian and Iranian gray zone activities, the broader sweep of the conflict? What do you think still holds uh, from our report or your reflections in light of recent decisions in terms of the sources of U.S. leverage, next steps that we should be taking? So first, let, uh, I'm just going to give you the, the one-minute spiel on what the report did recommend prior Please. to the last month's <laughs> decisions and developments. Um, we, we argued in our recommendation section that taken as a whole, even though the United States, that there's limited appetite domestically here or on the Hill to match the level of resources or even diplomatic investment of the Iranians and the Russians in Syria, that the United States still had compelling forms of leverage on the table to shape an outcome that was more conducive and protective of U.S. interests. And we identified four. So the first one was the one-third of Syrian territory that was owned via the U.S. military with its local partner, the Syrian Democratic Forces. Now, this was a light footprint on the U.S. military, only about 1,000 troops over the course of the Syria Study Group's report. And then the tens of thousands of, of forces, both Kurdish and Arab, under the Syrian Democratic Forces. And that one-third of Syria is the resource-rich, it's the economic powerhouse of Syria. So where the hydrocarbons are, which obviously is very much in the public debate here in Washington these days, as well as the agricultural powerhouse. But we argued that it wasn't just about this one-third of Syrian territory that the U.S. military and our military presence owned, both to fight ISIS and also as leverage for affecting the, the overall political process for the broader Syrian conflict. There were three other areas of leverage. One is political and diplomatic isolation of the Assad regime. This is, in our, in our assessment, one of Russia's goals in, in the Middle East is the propaganda win for Russia of rehabilitating Assad on the international stage, of basically forcing the international community to normalize him and welcome him back in without any behavioral changes. So holding the line on diplomatic isolation, preventing embassies from going back into Damascus. Two is the economic sanctions architecture. So some of this is part of the maximum pressure campaign of the Trump administration on Iran, but there's a whole suite of both executive and congressional sanctions on Syria and Bashar al-Assad, both for human rights abuses in Syria and to the backers of Assad for their activities on support, in support of him in Syria. And three was reconstruction aid. So the United States remains the overall largest single donor of humanitarian aid to Syrians both inside Syria and refugees outside of Syria. And there was some stabilization assistance in the part of Syria that was liberated from ISIS and controlled via the Syrian Democratic Forces in northern eastern Syria. The rest of Syria, though, is, is rubble. And what the Russians want and what Assad wants is economic reconstruction. Um, and that is something that the United States can basically hold a card on via the international financial institutions and our cooperation with the Europeans. 
So we argued that absent behavioral changes by the Assad regime, we should hold the line on preventing reconstruction aid and technical expertise from going back into Syria. So now in the past month, it looked like one of the most compelling. I want to play that again in a second, because there's first of some things you might missed. First, she says the U.S. government, the bit they owned, they own it. So first of all, the Syrian government has not <laughs> invited America to occupy their land. They have invited the Russians in. The UN has not got <laughs> a thing for the US to be there. The US are just there occupying it illegally. And she says they own, own, along with their partners, a third of the territory, which is the resource-rich powerhouse with the hydrocarbons. There's a lot of discussion in Washington about and agriculture and their wheat. So all the stuff that's going to help the Syrians, so you know, so they can sell that and make money and help help their people. They're occupying the powerhouse of the country. They own it. Then they're going to block any reconstruction aid. And Syria, she says, Syria is rubble. So the, the U.S. poured money into the Syrian opposition you know, the jihadi groups, and then who were aligned with ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Uh, I can't remember what's the... I can't remember the subgenre of Al-Qaeda, what it was called there. So now well, you can say, oh, they, they weren't giving ISIS enough money, but stuff was falling into their hands because they wanted to overthrow the government as well. They was on the same side. <laughs> Funny that. After 9-11 out fighting them in Syria, they're on our side. Maybe not working together, but we're on the same side as ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Surely we'd pause for a moment and think, well, you know, we're pouring all this money trying to throw Assad because he's that bad. Or do you want ISIS and Al-Qaeda to, to lead? Is that what you want? That's strange. And they want to block people normalizing relations by stopping them, you know, rebuilding their embassy uh, or, and uh, speaking again obviously with the syrian government in a friendly nature so i'm just going to replay again just so you can hear it and i mean imagine actually i'll, I'll replay it quickly just take it in and it doesn't even phase her face it's just talking about like nothing one minute spiel on what the report did recommend prior Thanks. to the last month's <laughs> decisions and developments. Um, we, we argued in our recommendation section that taken as a whole, even though the United States, that there's limited appetite domestically here or on the Hill to match the level of resources or even diplomatic investment of the Iranians and the Russians in Syria, that the United States still had compelling forms of leverage on the table to shape an outcome that was more conducive and protective of US interests. And we identified four. So the first one was the one third of Syrian territory that was owned via the U.S. military with its local partner, the Syrian Democratic Forces. Now, this was a light footprint on the U.S. military, only about a thousand troops over the course of the Syria Study Group's report. And then the tens of thousands of, of forces, both Kurdish and Arab, under the Syrian Democratic Forces. And that one third of Syria is the resource rich, it's the economic powerhouse of Syria. So where the hydrocarbons are, which obviously is very much in the public debate here in Washington these days, as well as the agricultural powerhouse. But we argued that it wasn't just about this one third of Syrian territory that the US military and our military presence owned, both to fight ISIS and also as leverage for affecting the, the overall political process for the broader Syrian conflict. There were three other areas of leverage. One is political and diplomatic isolation of the Assad regime. This is, in our, in our assessment, one of Russia's goals in, in the Middle East is the propaganda win for Russia of rehabilitating Assad on the international stage, of basically forcing the international community to normalize him and welcome him back in without any behavioral changes. So holding the line on diplomatic isolation, preventing embassies from going back into Damascus. Two is the economic sanctions architecture. So some of this is part of the maximum pressure campaign of the Trump administration on Iran, but there's a whole suite of both executive and congressional sanctions on Syria and Bashar al-Assad, both for human rights abuses in Syria and to the backers of Assad for their activities on support in support of him in Syria. 
and three was reconstruction aid. So the United States remains the overall largest single donor of humanitarian aid to Syrians both inside Syria and refugees outside of Syria. And there was some stabilization assistance in the part of Syria that was liberated from ISIS and controlled via the Syrian Democratic Forces in northern and eastern Syria. The rest of Syria, though, is, is rubble. And what the Russians want and what Assad wants is economic reconstruction. Um, and that is something that the United States can basically hold a card on via the international financial institutions and our cooperation with the Europeans. So we argue that absent behavioral changes by the Assad regime, we should hold the line on preventing reconstruction aid and technical expertise from going back into Syria. So now in the past. She actually says own twice, doesn't she? And, you know, she mentions how the U.S. is the number one uh, aid donor. I always find it funny how, you know, us, the U.K., the U.S., we're one of the top funders to, to Yemen, but we're also completely fueling the war there in Yemen by selling arms to them and supporting Saudi Arabia with training and uh, helping them with their equipment and every everything but being actually, you know, doing it yourselves. So it doesn't matter, you know, we're the top aid donor, but we were the reason they need the aid in some part. Like, it's just retarded. And she's just talking about, like, nothing. Just imagine being, like, her, her dad, Jimmy Dore mentioned this in the video, her, or, her, you know, her family. Oh, this, yeah, this, you, well, you're speaking um, a, a, um, a think tank. Sure, let this listen. And then you're sitting there and uh, you hear her say that, and you're like, so if you care about the people, why are you blocking the aid and reconstruction, sorry, blocking reconstruction? You're occupying their resource-rich fit bit that's going to help the people. And the maximum pressure campaign of sanctions is also going to hurt the people. So what exactly are you doing? You say, She mentions ISIS, but it seems like uh, they're not their, their biggest concern. And that actually leads us in. So, you know, they keep speaking about ISIS in here in Syria. Well, I've got another clip of John Kerry in a leaked video from a few years ago talking about ISIS and how they thought they could use that as leverage. But this is all about what leverage can we use? We're going to occupy their resource-rich country. We're going to stop them normalizing relations with other countries. We're going to stop all reconstruction, even though they're rubble. And... We are, was there anything else? I'm, pro I'm probably missing out something. But anyway, we're gonna use it, obviously clearly using ISIS an excuse. Well, let's go to uh, John Kerry. So I've got this on my website linked with, with the quote and I'll go back to that after I play it. Oh, and the, and the sanctions, which you know, <laughs> isn't good either. This is John Kerry. to fight for Syria, I don't think we are. I think in reality, we are not arming the right people enough. That's why we are losing a Aleppo right now. And I don't want it to be here next year when we can discuss how we lost Aleppo and there is still Idlib and Aleppo. So in reality, there is not enough political and armed support to those who consider them moderate. I wish we had his friends, not because they don't respect the international law, but because they are his friends. Well, let me ask you, Michael, I mean, uh, I think we've been putting an extraordinary amount of arms in, haven't we? Yeah, and I have to say, as you said, it's a double-edged sword because you give people the ability to defend themselves, but when you pump more weapons into a situation like Syria, it doesn't end well for Syrians because there's always somebody else that's willing to pump more weapons in for the other side. Um, the groups, the, the armed groups in Syria get a lot of support, not just from the United States, but from other partners. And we've never said that that Qatar, would be Russia, Russia uh, Qatar, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia a huge amount of weapons coming in, huge but, amount of money. But pumping weapons in causes someone else to pump more weapons in, and you end up with a level. That's I mean, the reason, the reason Russia came in is because ISIL was getting stronger. Daesh was threatening the possibility of going to Damascus and so forth. And that's why Russia came in. 
because they didn't want a Dutch government. And they supported Assad. And, and, uh, and we know that this was, this was growing. We were watching. We saw that, that Daesh was growing in strength. And we thought Assad was right. Uh, we thought, however, we could probably manage, uh, you know, that Assad might then negotiate. Instead of negotiating, you got Assad. Now you got the Putin to support him. So it's, it's truly complicated. I mean, you know how complicated. Now, if you didn't catch all that, was, this is what he said. So there's two people here. John Kerry, I think we've put an extraordinary amount of arms in. Michael Ratney, who's the other person speaking. And I have to say, it's a double-edged sword because you give people that ability to defend themselves when you pump more weapons into a situation like Syria, it doesn't end well for Syrians. Because there's always someone else who's going to pump more weapons in to the other side. The armed forces in Syria get a lot of support, not just from the United States, but from other partners. Qatar, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, a huge amount of weapons coming in of, and a huge amount of money. Ratnik, but pumping weapons in, causing someone else to pump more weapons in, and you end up with Aleppo. Kerry, the reason Russia came in is because ISIL, ISIS, was getting stronger. Daesh was threatening the possibility of going to Damascus and so forth, the capital. And that's why Russia came in, because they didn't want a Daesh government, and they supported Assad. And we know that th we know that this was growing, ISIS. We were watching. We saw that Daesh was growing in strength, and we thought Assad was threatened. We thought, however, we could probably manage. Uh, oh, <laughs> uh, no, that Assad would then negotiate. Instead of negotiating, he got Putin to support him. So what's he saying? They pumped in all these arms, pumped in all these arms, and then so did Qatar, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and other countries. And then obviously, so Russia came in. But then Kerry said, oh, why did Russia come in? Because they didn't want an ISIS government. And the, us, the United States, thought we could manage it. We was watching. We saw it all. But we thought Assad would go to the negotiation table so we could use it as leverage, obviously. But then Russia came in and helped him instead. So whenever they're talking about ISIS as well, that they're there. They're so we're there to fight ISIS, as she said in the, in the Senate. Well, you watched ISIS. Because you wanted to use it for leverage. He's willing to... So 9-11 happens. Number one enemy, Al-Qaeda, everywhere. You're going to have two wars, Afghanistan and Iraq. And now, you know, they're, they're basically... They're, they're really similar, obviously. You just have different uh, sort of views on some stuff. And now they're watching them because they thought they could use them against another country which because they couldn't invade themselves. It's just bizarre world. And then Russia come in because they didn't want, in Kerry's words, John Kerry's words, the Secretary of State and the Obama administration, Russia didn't want an ISIS government. But the US didn't see any problem with watching it grow and risking that. But now, don't worry, we're here. The problem that we saw and, you know, created from anyway, before from Iraq, Syria, all this stuff. Don't worry, now we're going to occupy your country, steal all your resources, <laughs> uh, stop construction, stop normalizing uh, relations, talk about humanitarian aid, we'll give you some aid wherever it goes to the actual government or the other groups, who knows uh, it's just gangster gangster, and they're just a cycle of causing problems, then they come in to fix them for their own benefit, but uh, I'll leave it there, I don't want to go too far in circles, actually let's just look up this think tank because I just had a quick look on my phone while that video was going and, uh, yeah, they're funded by some uh, nice people. So she's talking there at 2019. Who are some of their donors? Just fantastic. So we'll start with, with government donors. So 500,000 and up. Government of the US and Japan. Nice. Who else? Taiwan, the UAE, Qatar, you know. Qatar, the people who pumped in loads of weapons, all these different governments, uh, World Bank. So loads of governments there. Corporate donors, any? Okay, so we got 
Bank of America Corporation, Northrop Grumman, one of the biggest arms companies in the world. BP, Chevron, Citigroup, ExxonMobil, Facebook, JP Morgan, Lockheed Martin, biggest arms company in the world. Saudi Aramco, oil company from Saudi Arabia. Who was pumping arms? Saudi Arabia. Boeing, one of the biggest arms corporations in the world. General Dynamics, one of the biggest arms corporations in the world. You know, pharmaceutical companies, you know, a bit of everything. The usual people you'd see. Oil banks, a BA Systems, biggest uh, arms company in Britain, all funding this think tank, which is then at talking about how we can use its leverage, stop the normalizing relations, crush them after the US, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, who were involved in this funding of the think tank, were involved in funding the insurgency, which turned Syria into rubble. So I'll leave it there. If that's not some of the most gangster stuff you ever heard, just talking about it like it's their own country. Actually, imagine using the word owned. Owned. And then all the people there, like, you think, is that, is that normal? But apparently, I don't know. Who, I don't know who go to these things. Uh, I'm sure people who think, think like that too. Doesn't sound many hu- uh, hu- much of humanitarian assistance, whether they're the biggest aid donor or not, they helped contribute turning into rubble. But again, as I like to say on every video, <laughs> to stop... Uh, Go around in circles. I think I'll end it. Thanks for listening to the Truth Over Comfort show. And uh, hopefully I'll have some stuff soon continued of the series of gangster stuff like that.